What's up, guys, and welcome to the Invent With Me podcast, where each week we guide aspiring inventors and product creators to turn their innovative ideas into reality. Learn valuable tips, insights, and success stories from people roughing it in the field of inventing so that you yourself can make your mark in the world. I'm your host, Grant, inventor of Torque Strap, a killer new spring loaded cargo strap, a strap so easy to use, you just pull. Now, we have something really special lined up for you today, and um, candidly, that's because I didn't quite have a guest lined up, but I have something in my back pocket. I've been working on a book, and the reason for this book was not to sell or to monetize in any way. The reason for the book was as I began to run this podcast, Marcus and I certainly uncovered a ton of uncharted territory, really pointed questions that needed addressing, and we noticed a lot of trends. But the biggest thing we noticed was that we were starting to forget the little things that new inventors struggle with in the beginning. And that's when I decided to write everything down, and that quickly turned into a book. I have not finished the book, but I did record the first 30 minutes, and that's what I'm going to present to you today. Now, let me know if you like it. Let me know if it helps. The idea is to put you in the mind frame of being ready to escape your nine to five job. The reasons you're feeling less than in your current career and how inventing can pull you out of those. From there, it's a beginning to end guide from prototyping to financing. I really think if I had read something like this this in the beginning, matter of fact, I know I would be leagues ahead of where I am now. So I want to give that to you guys because I I truly care. I, I truly care. I hope you guys can tell. Now, the other order of business today. I didn't want to have to do this, but you guys made me, okay? I tried to be your friend. I tried to do this all for free. And you guys, you just, you just wanted more. I'll give you an example. I got an email from a guy about a week ago. He was asking me some pretty detailed patent questions. I take these emails very seriously. Anybody who's come on the show or I've responded to your emails, uh, Marcus too, you understand that we take these very seriously. And I had a guy email me asking me patent questions. I went ahead and, you know, stupidly went and did basically a patent search for this guy. Probably ate up a good 45 minutes of my Saturday, which is not easy to get by with a wife and kids. Sent him this long email back and he ghosted out on me. Now, whatever happened, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. But I have a lot of people who are serious, who really need answers, and they need them immediately. So I thought, what can I do? What platform, what place can I design where we can all work together? So I've been dreaming this up for weeks and weeks, and I thought, well, I'll just fill up a Facebook page with all this knowledge and insight and and, and, and chat and things like that. But that historically has never worked for creators, and here's why. People need to be invested. I could start a Facebook page. You could say, oh, cool, that's nice. I'll check it out. And you'd never look at it again. It's an odd thing. It's, I, it, 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 look, it drives me crazy, but it's skin in the game. So here's what I've done. I've set up a Patreon that is incredibly affordable. And if you don't get your money back 100 fold after the first couple of months of being engaged in this Patreon, just, send me an email. I'll literally Venmo you all the money back. Now, what this Patreon is going to do, there's going to be two tiers. One is just a general admission, and I highly suggest you you guys take advantage of that. That's all you're ever going to need. But that's going to be, that's going to include access to a feed, a news feed, much like Facebook and Instagram, but a hyper-focused feed on the things that have happened in the podcast that maybe you heard but you need to see and feel. So we're going to re-highlight those incredible moments. We're going to break down with blogs and bullet points why this is so important. 
a good example of that is uh, I had Elena on the last show. We broke down a pitch to get her product in the Ulta Beauty. And it was something that just kind of happened off the cuff. And it happened at the, you know, 49 minute mark. Maybe you're not paying attention. We're going to revisit that. We're going to hyperanalyze that. We're going to break the logic down of the things that were said. And we're going to give you the tools and the wherewithal to accomplish it. So you're going to have access to this feed where weekly I'm going to be putting in insane knowledge bombs and inspiration have you ever wondered why I'm so hot to trot and so fired up? It's because I watched three movies that within, I, I sat down, I took off a day, I took a day off of work and I sat down and I watched these three movies. I researched deeply what would motivate me the best and I watched these three movies and then I watched them again. And whenever I'm losing motivation, I pop on those same three movies. You're going to get tips like that and insights as to what brought me to where I am. Another good example of some things that I can put in that feed is um, financial hacks, things that don't translate very well to podcasts. It's hard to understand finances uh, in audio form. So what we're, I'm going to do is break down, how do we credit card hack? How do we get that Amex Plum card to where we can make a $70,000 purchase and not have to pay it back for 85 days, right? That's just the feed. Now remember, this is the first tier, the $6 tier. Second to that, you're going to have access to an exclusive Discord chat. And you guys know how much work I do for you for free. I would take, I would fight a bear for you guys for free. I already do. For six bucks a month, I'll straight up take a bullet. The point I'm making is have no hesitation about the $6 because I told you about the feed where you're going to get inspiration and tips that you would not think possible. Second is access to the Discord chat. I've stacked up the Discord chat with a roster of past guests, including a patent attorney, who are going to be active in this Discord chat where when you have a... It, for $6 a month, you have a patent attorney at your beck and call. You have a previous inventor at your beck and call. You have someone who's been to China six or seven times at your beck and call to answer your questions, whether it be engineering, manufacturing, financing. Uh, am I crazy? Crazy ideas, right? All of that in one place where only serious members discuss and help one another. And you better believe it. I'm going to be up in there every single day. Third, you're going to get a live chat feature on Patreon, okay? So when, whenever you have a thought, you want to reach out to me directly, I'll get back to you. I'll do my best. I might push you to Discord first, but within 12 hours, I'll respond to your message, okay? This is all for $6 a month. Think about all the money you could spend in this inventing journey, in this world, consultations, fees. Have you ever tried to talk to a lawyer? They don't want to talk to you because you're an inventor, I found the way that inventors can get that advice safely. Man, I think of all the money I wasted. If I could go back and consolidate all of my efforts, my travels, going to trade shows, going to China, paying retentions to, to retainers, to lawyers, if I could go back and consolidate that into a $6 a month bill, my business would be thriving and it would be 45% more profit based on the mistakes I've made, the money lost, and the exorbitant fees blown out the window. Now, there is going to be a second tier. The second tier is going to have everything that I just said, but you're going to get 60 minutes per month video consultations with me. And that can be private. Because right now I do consultations with people. I bring them on the podcast. It's public, right? And that may lead them to not want to divulge all the information, you know, not want to expose their IP. I get that. So you have a choice. You want it to be completely private, one-on-one -on -one with me, up to one a month, 12 a year. That's Insane, it's like an $1,800 value when you break down my hourly rate. All this for 24 bucks a month. For 24 bucks a month, you would never 
have to wonder again. And once again, if you don't feel satisfied with that, if for some reason I fell short, you're going to get your money back because I have no doubts about this. Now, I'm going to put the link to the Patreon in the top of the show notes on this show and on every show previous so you can easily access it. And without further ado, I'd like to now play for you the Blue Collar Inventor. As a successful inventor, I've typically been opposed to the notion of selling a book on inventing. I also told myself that if I were ever to write a book, it would only be after turning a small idea into a household name. I believe that anyone worth listening to should have at least a decade of experience and a wealth of knowledge. Based on the books I had read before achieving success, I noticed that truly successful individuals often spoke and wrote in parables. They would generalize principles of hard work and gloss over specific details, leaving me with unanswered questions. I decided I would follow suit. Subsequently, in early 2023, a friend and I launched the Invent With Me podcast. Marcus, the inventor of quick tie-down anchors, coincidentally offered a product that complemented my cargo strap invention nicely. The podcast aimed to uncover the journey of bringing a product to market, focusing intensely on the intricate details. Within 10 episodes, we began receiving encouraging messages and intriguing emails from aspiring inventors. By the 20th episode, we were inundated with questions and topics we had not previously considered. Guests soon became integral to our show as we gleaned insights from lawyers, trade show promoters, engineers, and fellow inventors. My initial plan was to offer as much value as possible throughout the podcast for as long as possible, and that remains my objective. However, what I did not anticipate was the profound impact the podcast would have on my perspective on inventing as a whole. After documenting our journey for almost a year, I became curious and decided to revisit our first episode to hear what our newest inventors might be experiencing as they embark on their journey. I was shocked by the topics Marcus and I discussed. What seemed like minor details now were major hurdles for us back then. Additionally, we were receiving questions about things we had said on air that we couldn't even recall. Why was this happening? Was it amnesia? I took a long drive that weekend and listened to our first episodes again, allowing myself to immerse into that time period. I began to relive the same fears I had felt over what I now considered trivial issues. My heart ached for the younger version of myself, who was still so preoccupied with insignificant matters like email marketing, setting up social media accounts, and dealing with taxes. That's when it hit me. At some point in the entrepreneurial journey, Business owners like myself simply become disconnected. Whether you call it forgetfulness, dismissiveness, or something else entirely, the fact remains. There comes a point when you lose touch and forget the nagging details. Today, I run a successful business that emerged as a byproduct of one of my inventions, a means to an end, if you will. Currently, I'm in the process of developing another invention, but I'm proceeding cautiously to avoid jeopardizing my current earnings. As of December 31st, 2023, I closed out my third year in business with $1 million in gross sales, a milestone worth celebrating. The year 2024 started off stronger than ever before with a successful product launch, another lucrative Kickstarter campaign, and a planned first-class trip to China in the pipeline. I can safely say I am about to lose touch. As I'm sitting in my office today, considering the direction of this book, my aim is to ensure you that I assist you with the intricacies I might forget tomorrow. My commitment is to write from a fresh perspective rather than from recycled facts, guaranteeing that you won't be left in the dark on any subject, big or small. After all, I'm just a guy with a 12th grade education and a lot of perseverance. Introduction. It's 3 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. Statistically, one of the most depressing times of the week. You've been employed in one capacity or another for some time now. Nothing surprises you anymore. The nuances of the American workforce have all exposed themselves as the formulaic and predictable cycles they are. Hourly wages and salary have become a predetermined path with no surprises. Somehow, so early in life, retirement becomes the only goal. For now, it's clear that financial freedom means sacrifice. In your 20s, you financed new vehicles and felt the associated pain. Thus, you drive a modest car. In your 30s, you bought a home with a mortgage that consumes 50% of your monthly income. Therefore, you only vacation once a year and buy scratchy toilet paper. 
Kids come into the equation, so weekend cash has been reallocated into the Christmas fund. When gaining is no longer an option, we become very good at losing. Income versus expenses. You can really only manipulate one. Cost of living raises, overtime pay, and the occasional bonus offer relief for a time being, but are usually lost on a new, irrationally justified creature comfort. So often you have found yourself overjoyed with the highly taxed overtime check, only to hand it directly to the wireless store so you can remain somewhat connected to your kids. Another year passes, and you find yourself 365 days older with three new monthly expenses. You take solace in the fact that your home will be paid off in 30 years. Your 401k, although you don't quite understand it, serves as a warm, fuzzy blanket that might one day ease your anxiety. One day. Much like a smoker going after another drag, another hour of work feels like it will provide relief. Ask anyone who has smoked, and they will tell you that more of a bad thing is usually a bad thing. Sure, one more hour of work means one more outfit for your kids but it also means one less hour of backyard playtime. Two more hours of work could mean steak for dinner, just not this week. Daddy's working. By now, you are keen on the idea of building wealth that will provide for your family's future without taking too much of your time. Perhaps you've made the leap into real estate and purchased a second home, which you can fix up, rent out, and then, one day, turn a profit. Or, perhaps you took one look at the value proposition of a rental home and spit it out like sour milk. That's okay. That just means you're normal. My guess would be that you lean back into one more hour of work and check the calendar for your next scheduled raise. That's okay. That just means you're normal. Then again, you read the title of this book, listened to audio samples, examined the cover art, and opened the first page. By that right, you're actually anything but normal. In fact, you're a bit abnormal. You're an inventor. I'm not an inventor. Specialists in the STEM professions, they are inventors. Thomas Edison, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates, those are inventors. They had great ideas that work and change lives. That is an inventor. Wrong. These are business owners. There's a difference. You see, everyone is an inventor because inventing is quite simple and does not require any tangible result. A toddler hiding household items behind a chair has invented a way to aggravate mom and dad without punishment. Mom and dad can now file a patent on the toddler's behalf titled Method for Creating Confusion While Avoiding Punishment. And for $9,500, a lawyer will draft 20 pages of legal language to ensure the patent processes through the USPTO. The sad part is, her invention would not be lonely among the millions of other useless inventions on file. Business owners invent and implement. Ask any business owner if they are an inventor, and they will likely say no. The accountant down the road has successfully invented a system of tax filing that can handle business, personal, and sales tax all under one roof without taking up too much of her time. An invention that makes her hundreds of thousands of dollars passively. Yet, she would never identify as an inventor. She's a business owner. You see, invention and business work together. One without the other has no value. A business can never survive without owning an invention that their competitor does not have. Something as simple as a scheduling app or a referral program can put a lawn care expert leagues ahead of their competition. A systemized method of filming time lapses of overgrown lawns being methodically manicured can, and has, launched lawn care businesses to the moon. Successful inventing is a beautiful combination of business skills and intellectual property. Combining these two elements usually equals wealth. In fact, much like gasoline and a match, the outcome can be nothing but explosive in most cases. Simple ideas, mediocre ideas, hell, even bad ideas can generate wealth. Just take a look at the pet rock from the mid-1970s. Gary Dahl filled a warehouse with something nobody else had. Rocks with eyeballs. Sure, Gary never patented the idea, yet he had tens of thousands of units of inventory. With a simple trademark, he now held intellectual property and inventory that nobody else had. Dahl then combined business marketing principles, and people pulled out their wallets. Dahl sold thousands of rocks per day in its heyday. And even as the fad faded, Dahl was able to rinse and repeat the same formula for three new tongue-in-cheek products. The truth is, not many of us are a Gary Dahl. We are inventors. We like to tinker. And we have one or two ideas in our notepad that we want to capitalize on in the most efficient way possible. 
Very few inventors are social media savvy, nor do they naturally possess the charisma to run a trade show booth in Las Vegas. Most inventors don't have a business background or the financial means to invest $100,000 into their own startup. Most inventors are smart enough to avoid the charlatans who want to make their inventing dream come true. However, they still fall for the fallacy that a company will take them from A to Z and make them wealthy based on some notepad drawings and a provisional patent. In my teenage years, I had an invention idea. I built a prototype in my parents' garage and saw that the invention seemed to have merit. My father loved the idea, and I thought it may be fairly useful, but I left it at that. Somewhere around age 30, I felt that I had maxed out my career in its present format. However, life continued to grow around me, and I was the bottleneck. So desperate for anything fruitful in my life, I started an unsuccessful lawn care channel on YouTube. A few weeks had gone by, and I was flush with 50 subscribers. I quickly viewed them as potential customers. But customers of what? T-shirts? After a bit more passive income research, I learned that the only way to make money selling something is to have a unique product that nobody else has. My inventing journey had begun. While it's true this journey requires money, my goal is to ensure that you don't spend nearly as much money as I did. Yes, it's true this journey requires you to find time, but you will not have to find absurd morning hours as I did, 2.30 a.m. to 5.30 a.m., Monday through Friday. Of course, you will need to perform amateur marketing duties to let people know you have created something special, but your marketing efforts won't embarrass you like mine did. Together, we are going to confidently march the short path to inventing success and create value that people need. Wealth will simply be a byproduct. Chapter 1. Imposter Syndrome and Other People's Opinions As I neared the end of high school, like many others at this delicate stage of life, I found myself at a crossroads. Having struggled with standard track algebra in my junior year and then later graduating with a 2.2 GPA, the path seemed clear for individuals like me. Find a trade. Back then, I believed that breaking into the trades was largely about connections. And while that's partly true, I've come to understand that it's more about positioning oneself. Eager to start working, I settled for a low-skilled factory job painting Caterpillar tractors. The conditions were far from ideal, and my coworkers were rough around the edges. I felt right at home. Meanwhile, my friends had chosen a more sophisticated route, aiming for high-paying jobs by enrolling in a vocational school at the community college. By the age of 20, my two closest friends were already a year into their apprenticeships, on track to become providers for their future families. I couldn't help but feel inadequate as they shared stories of evening classes, exams, and the promising future offered by their predetermined pay scales. At 21, I landed what I considered a good job at a communications company where I was informed that I would be grandfathered into the electrician's union. This news left me uneasy, as I hadn't gone through the traditional apprenticeship process like my peers. The apprenticeship held significance and was regarded as a sacred rite of passage. The owner of the communications company, stubborn as a mule, detested the union and had devised a method to handpick employees and grandfather them into union contracts, bypassing the union pool, a typical move for a free-thinking business owner. Over the years, my friends teased me and questioned my status as a union member, often demanding to see my union card. It was all in good fun, but it planted seeds of doubt in my mind. Self-doubt. Four years had passed, during which I successfully led crews of men twice my age and trained individuals in the field who graduated from the apprenticeship program ill-prepared for their roles. Outwardly, I was seen as an exceptional journeyman in my trade, but inwardly, I was an imposter. Imposter syndrome is the persistent fear that one day, someone in a position of authority will confront you, revealing that you've been deceiving everyone all along. The reputation you've painstakingly built the financial stability you've attained, and the respect you've garnered will all crumble in an instant once your true inadequacy is exposed. Surprisingly, imposter syndrome is incredibly common. Even individuals of immense stature and achievement such as Supreme Court justices, highly acclaimed writers, and even Albert Einstein have openly admitted to grappling with feelings of fraudulence at various points in their careers. This phenomenon isn't exclusive to traditional fields either. It affects even the most prominent innovators. Elon Musk, in a candid moment, tweeted, I feel like an imposter every day. 
underscoring that imposter syndrome can haunt even the most celebrated and successful individuals. Inventors like you and me often struggle with imposter syndrome at an intensified level. Typically, there's a nagging sense that inventors should be devoting their attention to something safer instead of pursuing their inventive endeavors. Perhaps focusing on education, getting a second job, or solidifying a robust retirement portfolio. Additionally, many individuals who have advanced in their career path dread the notion of losing their identity as professionals and reverting to a stage of struggle. This fear stems partly from the human inclination to care about other people's perceptions. However, as an inventor, you don't fit the mold of normalcy. You operate on a different wavelength altogether. Let me pose a question to you. When was the last time you went to the store to purchase a dish brush and inquired of the clerk, where did the inventor of this brush go to college? Here's another thought. Out of the thousands of customer inquiries I receive on my website annually, how frequently do you reckon people inquire about my years of business experience? Despite never graduating from my apprenticeship program, I thrived as a union electrician for an additional seven years, easily landing employment with major communications companies such as AT&T and Los Angeles County. Despite lacking a college degree, I now find myself negotiating high-level deals with CEOs of large corporations, approaching these discussions with the same ease as if I were negotiating with a neighbor over the terms of borrowing a lawnmower. Indeed, the reality is that people often care little about your past. They're far more intrigued by your present achievements, possessions, and what you can do for them. Results and confidence resonate deeply. Understanding your worth and articulating it effectively can swiftly disarm naysayers as they come to realize your imperviousness to their criticisms. Allow me to illustrate with a few examples. Example 1. Conversation with a friend. John. Hey, Jim. Word on the street is, you've got yourself an invention idea. I guess you've got a bit too much time on your hands. Jim. Actually, quite the opposite, John. After addressing my current income streams, I've made the decision to launch a product development company. I'm actively establishing sales channels and implementing systems aimed at delivering safer products to customers. What's particularly exciting is that once my patent for my flagship product is approved, my business valuation is projected to increase tenfold. This not only grants me more freedom with my time, but also alleviates the tax burden I face as a W-2 employee. Example 2. Conversation with a spouse. Husband. Honey, are you really sure that's how you want to spend our money? Don't you know that 90% of business owners fail? Wife. That simply means that 90% of business owners are ill-prepared. By contrast, 100% of good business owners succeed. In fact, most failed business owners were eager at a young age and took a trial-by-fire approach. I've done my research and assessed the risk. As for your question about money, I'm proposing investing less into this invention than we invest into wine in a given year, and I can guarantee a higher return. Example 3. Conversation with an employer. Boss. You're really going to leave a stable job for some invention idea? You really think you can replace $1,000 per week? <laughs> I know it seems daunting, but considering this company's frequent layoffs, it's evident to me that there's little stability in this job. I've crunched the numbers on Amazon, and once I'm moving just one-tenth of the units per day compared to my average competitor, I'll be earning $1,000 before breakfast every morning, seven days a week. Are you prepared to offer me a raise like that? Regular people will likely respond to answers like these with a mixture of surprise, disbelief, and perhaps even envy. Such confident and assertive responses challenge conventional thinking and expectations, often leaving others feeling dumbfounded. The truth about naysayers is that they often harbor an inherent fear of success. Witnessing someone else achieve success can force them to confront the reality that they may not be doing enough to reach their own goals. As a young man, I used to encourage my friends to approach cute girls as a form of entertainment, but to my surprise, it often worked in their favor. Afterward, I found myself caught between a flickering bar light and a grimy bar stool. This experience taught me that nobody likes to be left behind, whether it's in matters of romantic pursuits or personal success. We all have a natural inclination to aspire for more and to avoid being left in the shadows. If a 10-year-old child has no qualms about selling overpriced lemonade on the corner, 
Why should one take issue with selling a competitively priced product to adults capable of making their own decisions? When my first product orders began trickling in on my online store, I would feel a pang of anxiety every time I heard the cash register sound from my Shopify notifications. Suddenly, someone else's money was in my bank account, and it felt terrifying. But why? As a young boy, I had accepted cash from elderly couples for mowing their lawn or shoveling snow from their driveway. Somewhat conversely, as an adult, I had received overtime checks from companies knowing full well that I had done very little extra work during those hours. The difference lies in faith. Customers place a significant amount of faith in you when they hand over their money. Faith that your product will work as intended. Faith that they will receive the product in a timely manner. Faith that they have made an investment by paying you in advance before seeing the result. The sad truth is, not many products deliver on their promises. Still, consumers place a fair amount of faith in your promise. Yet they also harbor reserved expectations. One morning, my wife sensed that something was troubling me, and she was spot on. I explained to her that I was about to launch sales, and I had a dreadful fear that my first customer would return the item. I was scared of how I might handle the rejection. She pointed to the corner of the kitchen where three items from Target lay, packaged, labeled, and ready for return. Do you think Target cares? She asked. She had a point. I've spent years of my life shipping back pairs of shoes that were either too large or too small for my child's feet. I've set up desktop computers only to have them completely crash six months later. Every shopper in the United States has faced the difficult decision of whether to throw away an item or stand in the line at customer service for a petty refund. Shoppers place a very small amount of faith in products. When the products fail, they almost become numb to the pain. However, when the products meet the needs, customers become brand ambassadors for life. In today's era of drop shipping and the allure of get rich with Amazon FBA, fulfillment by Amazon, the market is inundated with junk peddled by desperate TikTok influencers, each scratching like a cat to monetize their 10,000 followers. Fake items flood the market, shipped directly to you from Chinese factories, and 35 days later, you're left with a pair of Nike shoes that split down the side your first round of pickleball. Wannabe Amazon FBA sellers bulk order hundreds of units of uninspected goods from Chinese manufacturers they've never even spoken to, ship the goods straight to an Amazon warehouse, and accept money from customers who ordered a child's toy but ended up with a choking hazard. Still feel like an imposter? Chapter 2. Ideation Odds are, if you've picked up this book, you already have an invention idea in mind. Based on my experience, the average inventor has at least three ideas brewing. However, if you find yourself without any, feel free to skip ahead to Appendix 1 for a comprehensive guide on ideation, creative thinking, and leveraging expired patents from the USPTO. Generally, ideation refers to the development of ideas in a creative manner. As tinkerers, inventors like you and I can get lost in the excitement of what an idea could do. As dreamers, we go down a winding rabbit hole of where your idea could sell. Finally, as providers, we speculate on how much money this invention could generate. Part 1. Expectations Inventors have an innate ability to dream big, and that's precisely why I admire them. They envision their products prominently displayed on the shelves of major retailers, in the hands of DIY television network hosts, and with their logo proudly spread across the hood of a NASCAR at the Daytona 500. Once again, this is why I love inventors. However, with these grand aspirations often comes the tendency to think about running before considering walking. It's sort of like practicing an NFL Hall of Fame induction speech on your first day of peewee football. While the enthusiasm is commendable, my focus lies more on outlining the necessary steps to help you reach those very attainable goals in a short amount of time. A reoccurring theme in this book will revolve around the concept of nobody cares more than you, NCMTY. It's a mantra that encapsulates the essence of taking ownership and responsibility for your own success. Consider these scenarios. If I could just get this invention in front of the right person, they will see the value and fund my project. 
N-C-M-T-Y. I'm an idea person. I'll leave the execution to another company who can cut me checks while I sit at home. N-C-M-T-Y. I'm going to hire the best design firm and pay their high fees because I want this done right the first time. Nobody cares more than you. The instinct of inventors often leads them to seek someone who can alleviate their pain and act as their knight in shining armor. Dreamers may even believe that their idea is so profound it will disrupt the system, causing chaos in the streets as news crews and helicopters swarm to the front lawn to get a glimpse of the genius behind the idea. Furthermore, inventors tend to romanticize the idea of speaking with head buyers of big box store administrations and flooring them with the awesomeness of their new product. They replay the conversation over and over in their heads, confidently proclaiming, my invention can do this, and it can do that. Market it to couples, and you can sell two at a time. Imagine sitting in a meeting with a retail buyer, pouring your heart out through a shaky voice for three minutes straight, only to be met not with enthusiasm, but with left-fielded questions you never considered. Show us your retail packaging. Where are your warehouses located? How many units fit in a master carton? How many cartons fit on a pallet? Have you read our quarter pallet guideline? Or, my favorite, just get us your best price DDP and we'll get back to you. I can tell you from experience, this is not a fun line of questioning to be on the receiving end of when ill-prepared. Remember, the two most important questions for inventors, what does it cost and when can I get it? Online customers, mom-and-pop stores, distributors, big-box retailers, and even potential investors all have the same two questions. What does it cost, and when can I get it? It's astonishing how little the function of your product matters. Grand ideas remain just that, ideas, and people don't pay for those. We were all taken aback when the ABC network show Shark Tank aired, as the sharks cared less about the function of the product and more about the proven sales. Many of us, myself included, thought Shark Tank would be a platform where people with cool ideas got rich. However, it turned into a forum where good business owners often lost equity in their company and gained a boss. Having had a boss my entire life, I have no desire to acquire another. Part 2 Feasibility analysis. The first step in ideation is determining whether you can afford the production of your idea. Let's imagine it's the year 2024, but no vehicle of any kind exists. We live in a dystopian society that mirrors modern day life with one significant difference. Walking is the only mode of transportation. Despite technological advancements and abundant resources, efficient transportation beyond our own two feet remains non-existent. As the inventive individual you are, you recognize this problem and set out to solve it by inventing the car. However, that proves to be the easy part. You share your groundbreaking idea with a friend who has financial resources, but they advise you not to quit your day job. Undeterred, you launch a Kickstarter campaign but it fails to gain traction due to its seemingly far-fetched nature. Turning to a licensing firm, you invest $20,000 only to find out that they are even worse at conveying your idea to would-be licensors. Six months later, $20,000 poorer, you find yourself, the inventor of the car, broke with no prospects. In an attempt to solidify your idea, you file a provisional patent, hoping it will lend validity to your invention. Despite your efforts, one year later, your patent pending status expires. You then proceed to file a full utility patent, paying the going rate of $18,000 for a technology patent. After two and a half years and $38,000 spent, you find yourself with a piece of paper worth less than the ink used to print it. Why has this happened? Aside from the marketing and intellectual property missteps, the answer is simple. You attempted your first foray into inventing with a car. By contrast, consider scaling back your expectations and offering the public something they can comprehend. Instead of starting with a car, begin with a skateboard. For nearly no money, you can kick off the prototyping process by simply bolting wheels to a wooden plank. As you refine your prototype, consider welding steel plates with risers and axles for trucks, enabling the rider to steer and shift their weight efficiently. To source manufacturers, turn to platforms like Alibaba or conduct a Google search. 
allowing you to communicate directly with wheel manufacturers to craft and assemble the custom parts for your skateboard. With a budget of $2,000, you can have 100 skateboards manufactured and shipped directly to your garage. Leveraging the power of social media, you can showcase the public that your idea works. When people inevitably inquire about where they can purchase one and for how much, you hold the keys to the kingdom. Although it may initially seem disappointing that your grand vision of a car has been scaled down to a skateboard, this concept is effective. By starting with skateboards and gradually progressing to more complex vehicles, you can steadily build your expertise and business acumen. After two years of successfully selling your skateboards, you can venture into developing a pedal cart. As your business grows, you may realize that attaching a lawnmower engine to your pedal cart is a more practical step. Following four more years of innovation and refinement, you will eventually have yourself a car. With vehicles now in your warehouse, you will have mastered various aspects of business operations, including distribution channels, social media marketing, wholesale, finances, and more. At this point, you'll truly hold the keys to the kingdom in your hands, poised for success in the lucrative world of automotive innovation. Did I mention you made lots of money along the way? Indeed, this example offers a simplified perspective on product development. We have yet to delve into the timing of patents and methods to protect your product through pricing, non-disclosure agreements, placement, and assembly techniques that safeguard your idea from theft. However, the principle illustrated here is clear. A great idea without a solid business framework surrounding it holds little value. You could end up dying penniless, holding numerous patents, and having engaged in countless conversations where you passionately explained to friends and strangers alike that you invented something that had the potential to change the world. All right, guys, there you have it. Episode 38 of the Invent With Me podcast. Hey, look, if that resonated with you, let me know. I'll keep on working on it. If not, I'll focus on bigger things. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe. If you're listening, follow the show on whatever platform you may be on. Remember, we took the punches so that you don't have to. See you guys next time.